Welcome, I'm Adrian Northington, Executive Director of the Foundation of Wayne Community College, and I thank you for joining our Arts and Humanities lecture tonight. You're in for a treat. Our very own Charlotte Brow will speak on the founding of Fort Bragg from wartime emergency to peacetime permanence. For a little housekeeping tips, um, we, please use the chat feature located in the bottom right hand corner to ask questions as we will have a time for question and answer at the conclusion of the lecture. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Margaret Bedour who will introduce Charlotte tonight. Margaret is a valuable member of our Arts and Humanities Program Committee, a retired Wayne Community College Humanities instructor, and a huge supporter of the arts in our own community. Let me welcome Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. I am proud and honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Charlotte Brow. I knew her when, when she was director of the Charles B. Acock birthplace, when she joined the faculty here at Wayne Community College, and when we became colleagues in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences over in Azalea Hall. Charlotte always has been known for being lovely and cheerful. She was beloved by her history students. She brought history to life for them. She has taken wonderful trips with her husband, Carl Brow, another personality at Wayne Community College, now, now retired from counseling here. The places they went, like the Hudson River Valley and points across the sea, she carried all over into the classroom. Charlotte eventually became chairman of our department followed by a slew of honors for teaching and leadership, among them the Foundation Distinguished Chair and the George E. Wilson Excellence in Teaching Award. For extracurricular activity in history and humanities, Charlotte and I co-produced a Native American festival on the campus here, a big production with authentic Indian dancers, crafts, and drummers. Later, we took a weightlifting class from PE teacher Doug Simmons and survived it. <laughs> then one year, Charlotte and I were team teaching history and humanities, each planning to do her own share of the work as we integrated the two subjects. When I found out mid-semester that I must have knee surgery, Charlotte ended up teaching both sides of the team, becoming, no doubt, more familiar than she'd hoped with Mozart, Casablanca, Van Gogh, and the cast of Cats. <laughs> However, she has remained to me ever since, grudgingly, graciously lovely and, and cheerful. Since her retirement, Charlotte serves as the Wayne Community College liaison for the Wayne Early Middle College High School and as director of the WCC Foundation's Arts and Humanities Program, which sponsors this very fall and spring speaker series, as well as great group trips to interesting destinations and many more opportunities for adult enrichment and education, plus the new K-12 opportunities for teachers enrichment in the Wayne County Schools. A native of Fayetteville, North Carolina, or I think they say Fedville, Charlotte researched the founding of Fort Bragg for her master's degree thesis at East Carolina University. And that topic is our Arts and Humanities program for tonight. So now, I give you the lovely, the cheerful, the terribly smart, Charlotte Brown. Thank you, Margaret. My goodness. I appreciate that, dear friend. Um, tonight's presentation is dedicated to Dr. Henry C. Farrell, 
who passed away from complications of COVID-19. Dr. Farrell was my thesis advisor who guided me through the research I'm going to share with you tonight. This one's for you. Located in Cumberland and Hope counties, Fort Bragg is one of the largest military installations in the country with over 52,000 soldiers there. Tonight, we're going to explore how it was placed in the Sand Hills area near Fayetteville and how it was able to stay when World War I ended and the military was downsized. Growing up in Fayetteville, Fayetteville, as uh, Margaret said, that is correct if you're from there, um, whenever you uh, heard what you thought was thunder on a sunny, cloudless day, you remembered you lived near Fort Bragg because that was the guns of Fort Bragg in the distance. When I left home to go to college, I would say I was from Fayetteville and people would mention Hay Street. If you're a baby boomer, and older, you know exactly what I'm referring to. But as a plug for my hometown, I want you to say that Hay Street is a thriving uh, place with museums and shops and restaurants now. Fort Bragg has definitely helped the city's economy. It, like Goldsboro with Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, uh, depends on that um, business from the military installations and it also brought much diversity to North Carolina. Now, Fort Bragg normally, you would associate it being with the Airborne and the Special Operations Forces. Um, those things were created later in its history. I believe it was 1942 when the Airborne uh, Command was put at uh, Fort Bragg, but you know, paratroopers were not a thing in World War I when Fort Bragg was established. And special forces would come along in the 1950s. But what ends up creating Fort Bragg, founding it, is the importance of field artillery in World War I. Tactics, especially um, revolved around it on the Western Front in Europe during that fighting. Not only was the importance of uh, artillery one of the reasons it would be founded there, but it was location, location, location. The land and the nearby amenities were paramount to its placement. There was also a very much of a strong desire by local um, leadership in Fayetteville to gain a military installation, to prop up the economy, boost the economy. And the local leadership had excellent allies in Congress and the U.S. Army and sometimes the War Department. But it's going to be founded in 1918, uh, not too long before the armistice when World War I ends. So the, the rest of our story is going to be how it's able to stay a permanent base. And boy, the times were a-changing. The Great War, or World War I as we call it, began in 1914, and Woodrow Wilson, our Democratic president at the time, had no intention of getting us into the European conflict. As a matter of fact, he said, we're going to be neutral to the Central Powers and the Allies, neutral in thought and deed. However, people like former President Teddy Roosevelt and General Leonard Wood called for something called preparedness. They said we needed to be ready because we would be entering this conflict. And events began to involve the U.S. more with Germany in a negative way with the sinking of the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, in 1915. That's where a German, you probably know the story, a German U-boat torpedoed the ship and it sank quickly with 128 Americans um, died. 
with about 1,200 others um, as well. This was new warfare. World War I would be introducing submarines or U-boats, uh, as the Germans uh, called them, that would, would use stealth in order to sink ships. The U.S. sent a strong denouncement to tell them to refrain from using that type of warfare against passenger liners and non-combatant ships. Um, they did it again, sunk a, a French uh, steamer named the Sussex, and then Germany pledged that they would never do that again. They did not want the U.S. to enter the war. But because of that, this and the this kind of strained relationship with Germany, Wilson decided to go ahead and sign the National Defense Act of June 1916, and it expanded the size of the Army and the National Guard. It would by 1917, so they were preparing. The Army had three, uh, 133,000 troops, and Wilson actually, even though they uh, did this, he actually won a second term to the presidency and he ran on a, a slogan of, he kept us out of war. Not promising he's go going to, but he kept us out of war. So he's reelected and then it's a good thing he didn't keep that uh, a promise of not going to war because in early 1917, the Germans decided to resume attacking non-combatant ships and even neutral ships to try to end the war quickly. They wanted to break the supply line to Britain from the U.S. Their foreign minister also got involved in some intrigue by sending a telegram to Mexico to the German minister there asking that German minister to request that Mexico go to war with the United States if the U.S. declared war on Germany. Well, both those things, the Germans breaking their pledge and the Zimmerman telegram caused Wilson to ask Congress to declare war on Germany in April of 1917. Shortly after we enter the war, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, and there it would create a draft force of 500,000 men. So that's a major increase, isn't it? By the end of the war, we would have millions in the service that either drafted, were drafted or volunteered. You did have uh, Neil Baker, who was Secretary of the War, to have to get busy. And how are we going to train these men? And so um, the War Department uh, was going to create 16 cantonments, military installations, military garrisons, and 16 tent camps so that they could train all of these new recruits. These should be located in the south, to allow for year-round training, and the tent camps, of course, needed milder winter temperatures, didn't they? Baker instructed, um, he would instruct General Leonard Wood, one of those who wanted preparedness, who was in charge of the southeastern district to find sites for those camps. But Baker would give the final approval. Now, Wood would uh, need to condemn the land and find areas where they could limit this. I love this. Uh, Baker said, you've got to find places where they can limit the sale of alcohol and there would be no houses of ill fame near the base. Good luck with that. Immediately, cities find out about this and they begin uh, promoting their town, trying to get interest to have a camp there. And here's a number of them in NC alone that sent uh, requests to be inspected. Wilmington, Raleigh, Greensboro, Hamlet, Salisbury, Asheville, 
Charlotte, and of course, Fayetteville. Congressmen of those districts joined in supporting the towns of their district, and Hannibal Godwin was uh, the congressman of the 6th district uh, that included Cumberland County. He, he was from Dunn, and he was uh, definitely interested in presenting that request to the War Department. All of these towns wanted the business that a camp would have nearby. And we in Goldsboro certainly understand that, don't we? And let's talk just a little bit about Fayetteville that put its name in the, in the bag there. Fayetteville dates to 1783. It's an old town. It uh, formed when you had two communities, Cross Creek and Campbellton, come together and, um, and form that town. So it, it's formed right, um, you know, 1783 before the, the ratification of the Constitution. Um, Campbellton especially had a high population of Highland Scots. So you have a lot of people in Fayetteville who are McKeithans, McNeils, Mac this, Mac that. Um, the town served as an inland port. Uh, one of the reasons it's built is because the Cape Fear is our, our river that goes the deepest into North Carolina, and um, the furthest point that you can navigate is where Fayetteville is, uh, or take a ship, um, navigable. Now, um, because of that, uh, that port status, inland port status, Fayetteville became sort of a hub of a plank road system in the mid-1800s. So because the river wouldn't go any further inland, they built these plank roads to go to Raleigh, to um, Salem, to Charlotte, and other places. So it's very, um, Fayetteville's always been interested in commerce and business. During the Civil War, it was a target of Sherman's uh, march uh, because the arsenal that was there. And by 1917, it's a small town with about 10,000 people and has good rail service. So Fayetteville tossed its hat in the ring. Now, geographically, Fayetteville sits in the Sand Hills. This is a unique area created millions of years ago from rivers that flowed from the Piedmont and deposited settlements against an ancient sea that used to cover the coastal plain. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but uh, that covered the coastal plain, very sandy. There are parts of the sand hills where sand is three feet deep. It's not uh, the best for crops, but it grows the most wonderful long leaf pine trees, which could be harvested for their sap to make naval stores, tar, pitch, and turpentine, and um, could later be used for lumber as well. There'd be scrub oaks there as well. It's rolling hills. Um, the Scots moved there and did some of that naval store um, industry. Amenities that Fayetteville had at this time were the Atlantic Coastline Railroad and three other lines. The river access I mentioned, a public works commission that could provide um, supply electricity and water to a site. And a fair business district, six warehouses. Uh, Fayetteville also promoted the fact it had large cold storage at its Fayetteville Ice and Manufacturing Company. They also sent word that they had a stable, I wonder about this, that could house 2,500 to 3,000 mules. Anyway, all of that, Fayetteville was promoting itself as the best place. And I'm just gonna read through some of the names of the people who were interested in this, because you're gonna hear them again. Didn't list everyone, but I want to introduce you to them. Thomas Sutton, the chamber, uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce, James Neal, mayor and a Democrat 
of Fayetteville, John G. Shaw, a Democratic former congressman, T.J. McAllister, chairman of the Public Works Commission, and one I really want you to remember you'll hear again is A.L. McCaskill. He's a Republican, big in the Republican Party and a former postmaster. He's going to have an important role later. They all sent letters, telegrams to senator, senators and congressmen that ended up with General Wood. Wood sent Colonel Hunt, adequate name, to look for uh, and visit the Fayetteville site because of all of that uh, great promotion. He's going to end up there in May um, 29th, 1917, um, and Hunt toured the area, praised the area's terrain. The price of the land was good, just $10 to $20 an acre, but there was only one drawback. There wasn't a real ample water supply at the site that he thought was so good. The Army Corps of Engineers, a Colonel Ledoux, and Wood would decide to come and check out this praised site. They arrived on June 27, 1917, and they liked it so much, they approved it, sent word to Baker, and a survey crew was sent there. Federal leaders were thrilled. Congressman Godwin was thrilled until Wood and Ledoux, person from the Army Corps of Engineers, decided they needed, they were looking for three more camps and on their list, and they decided to go to Charlotte. Well, Charlotte had an ample water supply. It had a bigger, more thriving business district. And while they were there, they changed their mind and awarded the camp to Charlotte. And instead of adding it to Fayetteville and the other list, they replaced Fayetteville and Charlotte won the camp. So on July 13, 1917, Camp Green was established. It was named in honor of Nathaniel Green, a famous Revolutionary War general who fought battles against Cornwallis in the Carolinas. Here's the catch, Camp Green. Y'all, have y'all heard of Camp Green? Probably haven't. It's no longer there, of course. Um, it may have had a good water supply, but the soil there is pure clay and will turn into mud after a very hard rain. They figured this out a little bit too late. And um, even though they get the camp, Charlotte gets the camp and builds it. You can see it's a, it's a tent camp. Um, it will never be a permanent installation. They'll use it for the war. It will still tr uh, train a large number of men, but uh, by about eight months, it was declared unsanitary because the sewer system wasn't working. It, um, Fayetteville was disappointed, but all they had to do was wait. And they had to wait for the right opportunity. But in the meantime, there was a little sour grapes. Fayetteville's people settled down and it became business as usual. Even the Fayetteville Observer, which was really a true pro-camp um, champion, changed its attitude about getting a camp. They said, Fayetteville was here when military camps weren't and will be here when military camps ain't. Another writer was a little bit more dramatic. He was, he wrote, I'm so thankful this, that his innocent relatives would not be demoralized and corrupted by wicked, depraved young soldiers roaming the streets like roaring lions, seeking whom they may devour. All righty then. They were a little sour grapes, right? There had been a couple opportunities when um, Fayetteville heard there might be a camp or this, um, an ordinance uh, depot, and those 
went nowhere. But there was another opportunity on the horizon. And that was for a camp. And this originated because the U.S. Army had to upgrade some of the things, uh, the ways that it fought. We were way behind in artillery, in aviation, and in um, tanks. Tanks had just been developed, and we were not able to do those. Um, if you fought on the, on the front, if you went to France, most of our soldiers didn't even know how to use uh, these weapons. So they ended up having to, even though they were artillery uh, brigades, they had to train for months there using these big guns. And um, some of these, so powerful, they could fire, um, the furthest range was about 13 miles. These were an integral part of World War I fighting on the, on the Western Front, as they call it, in France. Um, what would happen is the artillery played such a role, it would be used to um, fire on the enemy, pound them into uh, submission, and then send their troops out of a trench. Trenches were the only thing that could protect you, and they would charge the enemy. Unfortunately, they would meet machine guns and be um, killed instantly. Hundreds of thousands of men died doing this. The artillery would fire, there would be a charge, following charge, and it, uh, the only thing that could protect you was the trenches that they hid in. Um, so the artillery was an integral piece of these tactics. We needed to catch up. We needed to send our men overseas ready to fight, not waiting months to train um, at the back. They needed to go straight to the front. Enter General J. William, excuse me, enter General William J. Snow. He's the first chief of the field artillery. The name or the title had never been there. And he led a change to try to change the um, artillery brigades uh, and, and, and train them separately from the infantry units that they were connected with. Because what would happen at Fort Sill and other places is the infantry would be doing maneuvers and the artillery would be sitting around. And he said, no, you need to be constantly practicing. I need huge target areas and ranges where they can maneuver and fire, firing grounds and um, that wasn't happening. He wanted qualified instructors, um, but you get what he's saying. I need adequate grounds for maneuvering and firing. He had to really speak for, he says in his memoir, took 26 days of discussion with the chief of staff, Peyton C. March, to get approval of my ideas. And when he got approval, he reacted quickly. And he already had three training sites for, um, had three training sites for the um, field artillery, and one uh, was in Oklahoma. Well, actually, two of them. It was Camp Seal and, um, or Fort Seal and Fort Donovan in Oklahoma, and then there was Camp Knox in Kentucky. Now, Knox was a smaller area, but it had very high hills, uh, you know, a little bit mountainous, so you could get that type of training there. He needed a fourth, and this is where Fedville gets lucky, okay? Snow sent Colonel Edward P. King and Dr. T. Wayland Vaughn in search of another fort or camp for training. Um, Vaughn happened to be the chief geologist 
of the Atlantic Coastal Plain, and so he, he was part of the U.S. Geological Survey. He knew terrain. And he really believed that the Sand Hills would be a good location because they were agriculturally unproductive. He felt he could find them at the watersheds that occurred between the Piedmont and the fall lines of the rivers. But that's where you found the sand hills. King had told um, historian uh, Lieutenant William Nye many years later that he and Vaughn traveled with a compass and dead reckoning. They, they weren't looking for any place in particular. They went through Richmond. They went through Emporia. They went through Rocky Mount. They stopped to, to take a break at a small town called Manchester. That would be near Spring Lake today. Um, that was near the watershed of the Little River. And from there they learned they could spend the night at a nearby town called Fayetteville. The people there in Fayetteville had actually been tipped off by someone in Washington um, so that they recognized the staff car when it pulled in there. Um, but when King encountered these folks, probably Shaw and others, he asked for no interference, he wanted to look around, and then he would ask for a guide, and it did happen to be John G. Shaw. King and Vaughn liked the site so much, they contacted General Snow, and he quickly boarded a train there. Colonel King stated later for historian um, William Nye, he said, Fort Bragg is one military reservation for whose location no political or social pressure was exerted as a claim to fame. And Snow wants no political uh, interference with this either. He wants it to be a strictly chosen for the site. He issued a report that the site should be assigned to the field artillery. He needed 120,000 acres to be leased or condemned, and he wanted to house six brigades of field artillery there, two balloon companies, and one aereo squadron. The War Department approved the site, and Congressman Godwin received the news even before Snow's report was submitted. And they would um, ask, uh, the War Department would uh, want to get $1,500,000, million and a half, uh, to pay for the land, that 120,000 acres, through the Army Appropriation Bill of 1919. Problem is, they forgot to submit it in the bill, but we're going to be talking about that later. So officially on August 21st, 1918, General Orders Number 77 authorized the creation of Camp Bragg. And guess who it's named in honor of? Captain Braxton Bragg who, while commanding the Battery C, 3rd Artillery, rendered signal service to the Battle of Buena Vista, Mexico. He was chosen because of his heroism commanding the artillery at that famous battle. He was not, uh, his name was not chosen because he was a Confederate general. As a matter of fact, the order did not even mention Bragg's subsequent career in the Confederacy. And this is something I find very interesting about Snow. Snow wanted to name it Camp uh, Bragg because the name was short. There was a camp out there called Camp Zachary Taylor. So every time they typed a memo or anything, any paperwork, Camp Zachary Taylor, all of that work. He wanted short names. So for the field artillery uh, camps, 
Camp Knox, named after Henry Knox, the uh, artillery expert and or you know artillery officer under George Washington, um, and then Bragg for North Carolina's camp. Construction began on the site. Um, they had to contract workers. So many people are being, you know, in the South it was hard to get laborers, and so many people were being drafted. Thirteen million dollars was designated for construction. They had to actually get workers from Puerto Rico and Cuba to come and work there uh, because there was such a shortage. And this was also during the time of the Spanish um, influenza pandemic. Many perished during that time. It was so bad uh, on base that um, as they were working that the Red Cross actually donated $2,000 to put up a makeshift hospital for the care of many of the workers. Besides the, the Puerto Ricans and Cubans who were there, there were African Americans and there were whites as well. But that influenza slowed down work. While all seemed well, the issue of purchasing the land for Bragg and other installations was starting to be scrutinized by Congress. Wilson was overseas discussing uh, peace, um, trying to, to, to end the war. And uh, Northern congressmen also were uh, lambasting the fact that the War Department project seemed to be in the South. Republicans were pretty much against all uh, the, the Democratic War Department um, high expenditures. We'll see their, what they do later. To make matters worse, worse the quartermasters, uh, excuse me, had not included Camp Bragg's million and a half funding for the land in the Army Appropriation Bill of 1919. So in October, trying to, to, to remedy that, a bill was proposed by the House Appropriations Committee that included uh, that amount as well as money for Camp Knox that was in the same position. And just in general, about $2 billion worth of Army expenditures um, were included that were not in that appropriation bill. Well, when it came before the House and the Senate, they pretty much uh, voted against it. You can see that um, uh, this, this is going to come up again and be a problem. Now, I do want to show you where the land is and show you uh, where uh, it is, and I'm hoping you can see that. Yep, this area is what the 120, it's more than that today, probably about 140,000. Uh, this is the part of Fort Bragg within Cumberland County, and much of the base and the soldiers are here, okay? In Hope County, the neighboring county, it, the, the area takes up about a third of the county. And it's mostly the firing range and the maneuvering grounds. So those folks seem to have um, not benefited as well as the um, as Cumberland County folks who had wanted the camp there to be in the first place, right? This is, of course, showing it all laid out. Again, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but there are many roads. There are some that are still called plank roads um, running through the base. There's, um, and the county line is here, I believe. Mostly a bigger chunk of the land is in within Hope.
they start building. These are the enlisted men's barracks. They get completed around 1919. And these date to approximately that time. This is the officers club. It's a lot different today. This is the hospital, which it was a 500 room hospital. This would have, was pretty amazing at that time. Still dirt roads. And it's an artillery base. It's going to have, these are, I believe, 240 millimeter gun um, shells uh, for the guns that those soldiers are going to do. So um, I mentioned that Wilson had gone to Europe to be a part of to be a part of a peace negotiation that every uh, one desired. Um, an armistice was agreed upon November 11th, 1918. And it ended um, a terrible war, and everyone rejoiced. But there would be a question, do you need large army bases anymore? One of the immediate peacetime casualties after the, the uh, war was over was a camp, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, was Camp Polk that was in Raleigh that had just gotten started before the armistice, and um, they're going to abandon it because really just got started and the war has ended. But there was a question, what about Camp Bragg? It just got started in, um, it's just started in August and now it's November. Why can't we close it? Why can't we close Camp Benning? Um, there was a concern about that. The War Department had also used general funds to continue purchasing that 120,000 acres. They also used general funds to purchase acreage at Camp Benning in Georgia. This was a um, training ground for small armed infantry and very large area. Uh, that had gotten created close to when the war would end. So there was a concern. All these general funds were used to continue purchasing land at Bragg, Benning, and Knox without a special appropriation for it. After much criticism from some congressmen, Secretary of War Baker met before a House and Senate Military Affairs Committee who did not recommend stopping, you know, they didn't say stop purchasing the land, and they didn't say we approve of you continuing to purchasing the land. So since they got a mixed signal, they just kept purchasing. And finally, the War Department uh, issued a formal announcement, March 21st, this is 1919, that the three camps in question, Benning, Knox, and Bragg would continue. By May 1919, we see all of the, um, the things that I just showed you. Basically, everything was ready um, for the uh, camp, except maybe a few finishing touches on the hospital. Two months earlier, they had developed a flying field, which was named Pope Field. Later would be Port Pope Air Force Base. Um, Pope Field for a first lieutenant, Harlan Pope, who crashed in the Cape Fear River months earlier, and they named the field after him. So everything seemed like it was going well, but Republicans ended up, because of people's war weariness, they were elected um, and took over the House and the Senate in 1918. They were ready to get to the budget in order. They were tired of seeing the War Department and other war spending taking place. They ended up calling um, the idea of keeping Bragg and others uh, into question. And 
like I said, wanted to stop this type of spending. Republican members of the House promised to investigate the massive spending uh, on keeping these camps, and they held a debate on the House floor where congressmen from the areas where the camps were made a plea for landowners. Many had not planted crops, were told to move because artillery practice was starting soon, uh, barns were torn down, churches and schools were closed, and basically these congressmen said the government should fulfill its contracts. So at a subcommittee hearing, whether to keep Camp Bragg and even an, another installation, they started having these subcommittees and they were looking at each instance. And one subcommittee hearing where they were gonna talk about keeping Bragg or another installation that was in New York, you have for the first time, Leonidas Robison of the seventh district that represented Hope County. And he is not interested in the camp. He's not interested in the money um, that Cumberland County is. He, he really cared little for the camp itself. Uh, it was not gonna benefit Hoke um, as it would Cumberland. And the landowners had been told to leave their premises um, because artillery practice would begin in 90 days. There was no money for them to be able to relocate anywhere. They were really in dire straits. He said in a hell of a fix, he wanted them paid. Representative Godwin, 6th District, with the Fayetteville delegation with him, spoke to Congress and basically Godwin said he had received many letters from widows who were destitute now. They needed to be paid for their land. The committee was invited to come tour the camp and nine of them did and they were very impressed. They, they proposed salvaging other camps uh, that were no longer needed and used the monies to help support Bragg, Knox, and Benning. This act was known by, the, uh, was proposed by the Military Affairs Committee it was an act to amend the Army Appropriation Bill for 1920. As the bill went for a vote, the Republican argument came up that the War Department was deceitful of its spending of funds not allocated for land purchases, that it was using emergency monies to increase the size of the military. But Robinson came back and said to the defense of his constituents, the Hope County residents didn't invite the government to come here, and I've got 500 to 600 property owners who are displaced. Only 50,000 acres had uh, been purchased. 91 um, had contracts. 60 were under condemnation proceedings. Both the House and Senate passed the bill with a total uh, adding the you know, creating the money to finish the appropriations at Bragg. It was $1,173. So his pleas did pay off, didn't they? This would help for finishing construction and pay for the land that had not been bought. So life at the camp continued on. Oh, I do want to say that here was one of the, the best quotes that I read in my research. Um, you had a longtime residence tell uh, Judge Henry Gross Connor, who was, con was in charge of the condemnation proceedings, he said, when Sherman and his bummers came in 65, they almost ruined us. But this invasion has completed the work. That's exactly how they felt. But things seemed to go on smoothly. You had um, units there. I love this if you can read it at the bottom. Uh, this is a postcard where you can check the little things. If you don't have time to write a postcard, you can check all these wonderful things like this, the camp is swell, not so hot, great stuff, the nuts. You can check whatever and go through, uh, mail it in. But things just kind of, life went on at the camp. 
uh, they had lots of training, social activities. Um, you had the 5th, 21st, 17th um, artillery brigades stationed there. It also uh, started training National Guard artillery units. It became a recruiting station for the Army as well. And then you had this man come. Colonel Albert J. Boley comes to be commander of the fort um, November 25th, 1920. You talk about an exemplary leader. And he had commanded three of the units I had just mentioned. He would be the best friend to brag. He quickly um, started learning about the fort and the area. He um, asked uh, Peyton C. March, the chief, um, uh, chief of staff, to come inspect it, General John J. Pershing. He um, asked them to come ins inspect it, and this is what uh, Pershing said after his visit. He really praised Fort Bragg, or excuse me, Camp Bragg. He said, for the extent of the firing grounds and the veil uh, of the terrain are unusually superior. It is doubtful if this reservation could be duplicated anywhere within the United States for any reasonable amount of money. All seemed well until there was a new president in the White House who appointed a new uh, Secretary of War, John W. Weeks. Weeks had supported Warren G. Harding for president and um, he ends up getting the task, the onerous task, of downsizing the War Department in peacetime. He had been, uh, he had served on the Military Affairs Committee and had listened to many of those arguments that I just talked about. He wanted, he was very aware of, maybe we need to downsize the camps. We lost one of the champions of Camp Bragg, and that was Hannibal Godwin, who was, uh, did not get his seat. Um, he was not reelected to his seat. You had a Homer Lyon come from Whiteville, but the senators, Lee Overman and Furnifold Simmons, were there to try to protect Bragg, as well as a very active federal contingent. One of the largest changes uh, coming from Congress um, that was going to start with this downsizing was reducing the strength of the Army to 175,000 men. Some units, field artillery units and others, would actually go inactive. Uh, they'd keep the name in case they needed to reactivate them later and keep their historic integrity, but there was a true downsizing. And they started listing camps they wanted to close. And guess which one is on that list? Okay. Camp Bragg. All right. Republicans uh, had blamed Democrats for the failed peace and unauthorized war expenditures, and Weeks was going to go in and demobilize and shrink the size of the army. It was going to be a retrenchment effort. Since Camp Bragg was um, being considered to be closed, um, you had um, Boley quickly trying to come together and, um, and save the camp. He truly loved Fort Bragg. Okay. Senator Overman had alerted the town and Boley, who by this time, he's going to end up being a brigadier general. Um, they alerted the town and Boley uh, that Bragg was on the list. Um, Boley, while he had been promoted, and he was going to actually be sent to Camp Knox, where all of the soldiers from Bragg were going to be sent. He still wanted to keep Bragg. He knew it was superior for artillery training. So he devised a scheme. He really had true um, political instincts. And so 
what he did was he said, first of all, we've got to, um, we can't have any Democrats involved in this deal. We have to uh, instead work with our local Republicans, okay? Because we've got to go meet a Republican Secretary of War. He took two Republicans to, uh, and met with them. One was, I believe, A.J. McCaskill, the other one, W.E. Kinley. He calls them the Scotsman and a financial agent uh, in his uh, memoir. And they're going to go meet uh, to Washington to meet with the, um, the head of the state Republican Party who was John Moorhead at the time. Foley said um, when he met Moorhead, he told him, he said, you've really got to keep the camp because Moorhead, being in charge of the, the state's Republicans, um, there was a concern that, um, um, that Marion Butler, who was a very prominent uh, Republican in the state, was trying to take over, get control of the party. And even though North Carolina was truly a democratic state, there was one thing that uh, the Republicans had. They had 26 votes out of North Carolina that would be at the Republican convention. And so Foley said, you have got to help me keep the, the camp. And if you don't, it's going to look bad and Marion's going to take over the state Republican Party. They felt like those 26 votes that North Carolina had that Secretary of War Weeks wanted. And so, um, because Secretary of War Weeks was being schooled, he uh, boldly thought, for the presidency in the future and would like those votes. So Moore had asked the two other Republicans uh, at two other prominent Republicans to convince Weeks to meet with the federal delegation. So you had Bowley, McAllister, Kinley, um, and Moorhead that are going to go meet with Secretary Weeks to try to save the camp. When General Snow, who wanted nothing political going on, heard about this, he promptly left town. The delegation met with Weeks on August 11th, and the Scotsman literally had to ask Weeks as a personal favor to talk to Bowley. I don't think uh, Weeks wanted a, an officer in there. But Bowley comes in and says, look, why don't you come to Bragg and see for yourself what a great place it is. And then John Moorhead told Weeks, please don't, don't do away with the camp until you've at least toured it. And this is one of the uh, uh, interesting parts of the story because Bowley made sure every detail was perfect when Secretary Weeks and a general harbord decided to come to Fayetteville and tour Camp Bragg. They arrived September 11th, 1921, and they put on a grand tour. Um, first of all, Bowley hired the best uh, cook and waiters in Fayetteville to serve them breakfast. Um, he set up a huge... Uh, map that he went over at the base and, and told them all about what they were going to see. The three uh, went touring in these big white cars uh, through the base. They had already prepared the roads, uh, fixed any kind of bridges and, and, and that type of thing so it would be a smooth ride. They equipped, I love this, they equipped the big white cars with thermoses and drinking cups and first aid kits and boudoir tissue. The town actually, uh, excuse me, the tour uh, went on all around Camp Bragg, but it wasn't too exhausting to wear them out. And Bowley made sure that they stopped by a lake where there was a, a pig being um, prepared, a uh, barbecue, and uh, they had a nice lunch. They got back in, they were touring, they um, stopped uh, and watched a polo match. The secretary had never seen one of those, uh, so he was pretty impressed. And then they ended up in the evening at one of the oldest, finest houses um, 
in that area, served him a good mint julep and a fine dinner with scuppernong wine. I love the details. And then decided to get down to business. So Bowley ends up, he and Colonel King, the man who ended up um, finding Camp Bragg's site in the first place, um, really tried to convince Weeks to, to keep Bragg. Now King thought all was lost, but when Weeks asked General Harbord, in case we retain Bragg, you had better send General Bowley to Camp Jackson uh, so he can salvage all the property that he may need for this camp. Bowley said when, when he asked him that, he knew he had won. And Secretary Weeks goes back to Washington and later telegraphs Bowley and said, if we can make the camp, we can make the, we will make the camp permanent if a trolley line will be constructed from Fayetteville to the camp. And Bowley got a contract within days to do it. So the order to close Bragg was rescinded. And they assigned the 13th Artillery to the camp. It was truly the best maintained camp that Weeks had ever seen. When news got back to Fayetteville, they cooked a thousand pounds of pig and the town celebrated um, with that news. On April, 20, uh, excuse me, on April 8, 1922, General Orders Number 5 announced several permanent military bases with Camp Bragg listed and signed by Pershing. I'm moving, uh, moving ahead of my slides, I see. Um, that rail line opened August 19th, which was wonderful. And then on September 30th, 1922, Camp Bragg became Fort Bragg. And that secured its permanence. So today, Fort Bragg is one of the largest military installations in the country. It was created during a rigorous building program by the War Department during World War I. And it was created for the training of the field artillery. Another factor was the desire of a community and its political representatives to secure the base but none of this would have occurred if the land itself had not been the perfect location for a field artillery need. It was truly the right place at the right time. And you know, the decisions to keep Bragg, Benning, and other facilities helped us be a step in the right direction for our next major conflict, 20 years later, World War II. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to take those. Okay. I did get ahead of myself. I will say that this is uh, Secretary Weeks. Um, it was such hard work for him. Uh, as Secretary of War trying to, 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 you know, go through sort of a retrenchment of the military, that about 1925 he had a stroke and uh, had to stop service, and um, I'm not sure if he eventually died after that. Um, but this is what they were concerned about. Look at, the, look at the amount of expenditures going on. And this is 1919. So um, look at how much our federal budget had been before the war. It's kind of amazing. Any questions? Yeah, just a couple of things. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, who was the land procured by, I mean, from, I'm sorry. Was it 
Fayetteville, the counties were, were their landowners that it was bought from. The land that Camp Bragg was originally built on. Who owned that land? Who owned? Who owned that land? Who owned the land that Camp Bragg was eventually? Yes. It was, it was, um, as far as where the base itself was, I don't know who owned those tracks. Um, but um, when they did the, they, they assumed it was about, in the early days, they thought it was about 170 um, families. But then they get into it, and there's entails, uh, there's um, miners that have parts of property, you know, all of this. Um, and they ended up with like about 500 or more um, owners. But no, I don't know. Um, there, there, is a, there is an interesting um, owner, and that is the Rockefellers owned a preserve called Overhills that was um, a big chunk of the Hope County part. Of course, you know, that's near Southern Pines and all that's a resort area. Okay, so the Republicans were worried about all the money being spent, but yet at, in the end they fought, they were the ones that fought to keep the base. Is that correct? Right. They, they would ultimately fund um, and keep the base. And I think it was after that really sly convincing mm -hmm. that um, General Boley did uh, with the other Republicans, local Republicans coming in and helping it. So It's just interesting how they, you know, fought against it so hard. And then in the end, they're the ones who... They're the ones who saved, saved it. it. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. I'm sorry I went over a little long.